Before you watch this video, know that it is the second of two pouts, with pout 1 being damn near essential to understand what's going on in this one. So definitely go watch that one first. Now to recap where we were, a new iteration of Noah and Mio had just been born, who are both incarnations of the other halves of the souls of N and M. While they didn't know it at the time, they would come to bring a massive revolution to Zed's world, but not before learning how to fight. Like everyone else in this world, Noah was born into a life of combat. It was all anyone ever learnt. Although he didn't find it nearly as agreeable as his comrades, he still made some good friends from his Kvesian colony. Lance, an assertive soldier who isn't afraid to speak his mind, but is a kind person deep down. Uni, an assertive soldier who isn't afraid to speak her mind, but is a kind person deep down. And Yorn, who makes up for the other two's dynamic duo by overflowing it with his pitifulness. Although they all came together to form a tight pack of friends who could rely on each other during training. At the same time, in an opposing Agnes colony, Mio was the top of a class, and soon grew to become good friends with an absolute unit of a little girl, Senna and a well-meaning know-it-all, Tyon. Back with Noah, a nopon known as Riku somehow got his hands on Lucky Seven, seemingly the same legendary blade the Founders used to fight back against Mobius while freeing colonies from their flame clocks. Knowing Noah quite well, Riku entrusted him to wield the sword, and Noah promised to keep its original form hidden in all but the most dire situations as he deemed it far too dangerous for normal use. Now, in this particular video, I won't be going over every single side character's backstory, for example Riku's, and how such an innocuous Nopon got his hands on such a legendary blade. I have many future videos planned to do exactly that, but for this one, I'm going to gloss over all the ones that are integral to the story, except for Yorns. Him, Noah, Lance, and Uni were tight as nails, and they fought well together, although Yorn always tended to err on the meager and self-sacrificing side, a tough trait to have when your whole life is based around combat, although with the support of his friends, he was able to make do. Yorn regretted never being able to help his friends in return for all their support, and was unable to ever see himself as anything but useless weight that slowed everyone down. He would continue to see himself as nothing but a nuisance to his friends, all the way until the day of an enemy attack. As Yorn and his friends fled from the enemy, a building crashed down and was moments away from hitting Lance, but sheepish, kindly, selfless Yorn leaped in, pushing Lance out of the way, sacrificing himself for his friend. For the first time in his life, he could repay his friend's kindness before being crushed by debris. Still under attack, they had no time to mourn his death, continuing to run away only to be trapped by the enemy. While it seemed like our protagonist would meet his end here, they were saved at the last second by a soldier known as Silvercoat Ethel. The enemy was eventually repelled and the colony rebuilt, but nothing could heal the guilt Lance would carry with him for being the cause of his friend's self-sacrificing death. Little did any of them know that Yorn hadn't died that day. Well, he did, but instead of his soul getting put back into a growth pod to be recycled once again as a soldier, Zed decided he saw potential within him as Homobius, recruiting him into his personal guard. As he became Mobius, Yorn was treated to the memories of all his past lives and saw he was always a useless loser, the underdog in every single one of them. Filled with shock and disgust, his mind twisted as he became Mobius. He came to see his friends who supported him through his weaknesses as monsters who laughed at his incompetence. Of course this was incredibly untrue, but with no one to tell him otherwise, he convinced himself that it was, and in his rage swore that he would get back at all those who saw themselves as better than him. Revenge would have to wait, as Noah had just become an essential member of his colony, chosen as an offseer. In her colony, Mia was chosen as well, and while she may have been a bit hesitant towards the job, as Offseers were often confined to the back of the battlefield, Noah accepted his new responsibility with pride, 
insisting to not only offsee the souls of fellow Kabesi soldiers, but Egnian ones as well. The way he saw it, even their enemies deserved some peace after death, not knowing that in reality, he was only helping Zed's war reign eternal. Regardless, so continued Noah and Mio through their terms, experiencing the normal lives of a soldier, but that was about to change. After a run of the middle battle, Noah, Lance, and Uni return from a hard day's walk, but don't get any time to rest, as an unidentified ether signal is detected, flying right in between of their Cavessian colony and Mio's Egnian one. Unknown to the residents of either colonies, this signal was coming from an Orbor stone, being snuck to the city by the lost numbers. Unfortunately for them, the Mobius controlling both colonies knew exactly what it was, and each sent their forces to destroy the stone. Along with a grand portion of his colony, Noah was sent out with his usual crew, who were accompanied by Mwamba, a chipper chap whose personality trait is almost entirely talking about how he's a single battle away from quitting combat forever and retiring to a safer job. I wonder if he's about to die. The colony's armies approached the Lost Numbers and began attacking both them and the opposing colony in a brutal three-way clash. Amidst the confusion, both Noah's and Mio's squad encroached on the Ouroboros stone, with all but one soldier left defending it, Guernica Van Damme. With no memories of their past love, Noah and Mio fight. Of course they do. It's all they've learnt their whole lives. But Van Damme stops them screaming, pleading for them to stop. He tries to explain that they're not each other's real enemy, but before he can go any longer, Mwamba shows up, and oh no. A Mobius has come to claim the stone, and after seeing that some soldiers just lent to the Ouroboros, isn't keen on letting them live. This particular Mobius is currently in an interlinked form, combining both Mobius D and Mobius J, Yorn himself. He doesn't reveal his identity to his old friends quite yet, and instead they mock Vandom for thinking he stood a chance. Noah's and Mio's squad form a temporary truce to take down this massive foe, but they stand no chance against the power of a Mobius, certainly not an interlinked one. As they fought, Vandom desperately walked to get the Ouroboros stone working, now heroes bought him just enough time for him to activate it. Our hero's souls left their bodies as they were chosen to be the next generation of Ouroboros. Mio and Noah were treated to each other's memories and then fused into one, interlinking into Ouroboros and unlocking its overwhelming power. With their newfound strength, they managed to drive back the Mobius, but that was only the beginning of their problems. Before Yorn and Dee left, they marked the crew with a special mark, signaling to the entire world that these six are their enemies. Moments away before his own death from the injuries he sustained, Vandom spent his last words telling the crew to search out the city hidden within Sword March. His life left limited, he kept his words short, encouraging this new Ouroboros crew to fix this twisted world before passing on. His moats released to the winds, Mio made sure he was off scene with honor, with Noah joining her, honoring the souls of all those who died in the brutal battle. The dust cleared, the battle having long been over, but due to the mark Mobius had left on them, neither group could return to their colonies without being attacked by their own friends. So, the crew created an unlikely alliance between Keeves and Agnes. Putting aside their differences, the group heeded Vandem's final words and headed to Sword March to find the hidden city he spoke of. Before they headed out, they noticed a few things. One, the flame clocks they each had in their irises disappeared. By becoming Ouroboros, they had been freed from the shackles of that constant drain on their lives, and were free to live life without stealing it from others. Secondly, they noted Vandem's wrinkles. Not knowing anyone to have lived past 10 terms, this was quite the shock to them, although they wouldn't figure out what it meant for quite some time. The crew began their adventure, and it quickly proved to be much more difficult than they'd expected. 
Not only were both factions hunting them down, but they were dealing quite poorly with the heat of the desert they had to cross. Despite their former status as enemies at war, the new Ouroboros crew were quick to accept Den and help each other out, and began to understand that, despite both colonies despising each other for the war they fought, they were quite the same. None of them wanted to fight each other, they were only fighting to live, fighting to survive. Everyone got along well, but among the group there were already some extra special connections being made. The three important ones being between Noah and Mio, both offseers from their respective colonies, the desire to heed Van Damme's words and better the world, Lance and Senna, sharing a love of muscle building and dumbassery, and then Tyon and Uni, sharing nothing? Honestly, I think they hate each other, but they're the last pair so they don't get a choice. Anyway, their progress was slowed in the scorching desert heat, and from their tardiness came a rather big problem. They had been caught up to by a colony under control of the Red Eye of Mobius, their Furanus bombarding them with attacks. Under siege, they hid for cover, so their commander came out to face them herself, turning out to be none other than Silvercoat Ethel, the same one who had saved them from the invasion all those years ago. Despite their pleas for peace, under Mobius's control, she could see them as nothing but monsters, and so they fought. A veteran fighter, Ethel was close to beating them, ending our story before it even had the chance to begin. But as luck would have it, some purple fog rolled in just at the right time, disrupting Mobius's control over her and revealing Noah and his friends as they really wore. Shocked to see who she was really fighting, Ethel paused, one moment too long. The colony's Mobius sensed her hesitation, teleported over, and punished her, deciding he could only rely on himself if he wanted the job done. The consul gathered his power and took on the Ouroboros crew himself. It was quickly clear to Noah that they were fighting a losing battle. As soon as they damaged the Mobius, all he had to do was drain his soldier's life force, running it through their flame clock and inhaling it himself. The longer they fought, the more they grew tired, while Mobius killed as many soldiers as he needed to keep up his power. The crew worked together to get a chance to destroy the flame clock, but their weapons bounced off, its origin metal far too tough to be cut by any normal weapon. Lance and Senna managed to pull off an interlink, combining their strength and intelligence, achieving a single brain cell. Even Tyon and Uni put aside their differences and interlinked through the shared will to help their friends, but it wasn't enough. Realizing he had no other choice, Noah steeled his resolve and pulled out Lucky 7. The only thing that can cut through origin metal is other origin metal, and Noah proved it by cutting straight through the Furanus, freeing the colony's soldiers from their flame clock and severing the Mobius's energy supply, ending the battle. With no more flame clock, Ethel's colony no longer had to fight for life force, although they hadn't been freed from their lives' strict timer, still only able to live to 10 terms. They all decided to lay low for a while, unaware of how the other consoles would react to them breaking free of their flame clock, and our characters continued on their journey. The gang also discussed the nature of the consoles, realizing that colonies from both factions had them despite being mortal enemies which started them thinking that perhaps the Mobius weren't fighting for the betterment of the colonies, but for themselves. And the consuls were servants of the queen, so are the queens the masterminds behind everything? Or are they the ones under control of the Mobius? Or perhaps there's an even more powerful entity orchestrating the entire world from the comfort of the shadows. After an untold amount of time spent wasting away in Mobius form, waiting for the chance to change the world, Em's time had finally come. She had seen the Mobius sign in the sky, indicating a new set of Ouroboros, and decided she would gamble on this group to be the ones to defeat Zed. That the other half of herself and En might just be able to overthrow his eternal reign. Still possessing the amulet to unlock Cloudkeep, wherein Queen Nia slept, Em snuck off and found an encampment of the Lost Numbers. A lone girl piqued her interest, and she gave the amulet to her, explaining her rebellion against the other Mobius and how this amulet needed to make its way to the new Ouroboros crew. 
The girl she gave it to, Gondor, obliged, and as the daughter of the Lost Numbers' current leader, out to support the Ouroboros on their journey. The gang continued on their travels with newfound enthusiasm, having just defeated a consul and destroyed a flame clock. Both tasks which would have seemed impossible a mere few days ago, the crew was confident and as they continued their trek across the wall, they managed to free many more colonies from their flame clocks. They even fought against Yorn a few times, learning his true identity as a Mobius and his hatred for them and their overconfidence, but they always came out on top. Despite his escape, they still managed to free the colony under his control and kept moving forwards towards their goal. While Zed might have still been confident that this current crew of Ouroboros would ultimately lead to nothing, some of the other Mobius were getting pretty worried, and had two special war machines built for two of the greatest soldiers in the land. One would be for Silvercoat Ethel, and the other for Flaming Kamuravi, Ethel's sworn rival from an Agnes colony, and both were to find and kill Ouroboros. The consuls had recently developed a new weapon known as the Annihilator, capable of wiping entire colonies off the map, and with it, threatened the rivals' respective colonies if they didn't obey the orders they were given, leaving them no choice but to hunt down our heroes. The hunt began, but once the two elite soldiers found Ouroboros, they simply refused to fight them. To Ethel and Kamuravi, nothing was more important than their rivalry, and they began to fight each other in one final duel. While Ethel was unable to be mind-controlled, having already gone through it once, the consuls could still control Kamuravi, that is, until he ripped his own eye out, so he could enjoy his final duel without anyone getting in his way. Ethel and Kamuravi fought out their epic battle, and both died. Happy, they were able to clash blades one last time. Infuriated that their new battle mechs went to waste, the two Mobius present interlinked and took on Ouroboros themselves, and even came close to winning, but in the end they stayed in their interlinked form for too long, both obliterated from the preceding annihilation event. After hearing of the machine that could destroy entire colonies at will, the crew knew that they'd have to put their mission on hold to destroy it. If not, all their work freeing colonies from flame clocks would go to waste, and they would be wiped off the map in a blink. They entered the Cavessian castle where the super weapon was stored and infiltrated it with relative ease, almost too easily. After beating back Yorn and Dee once again, they managed to destroy the Annihilator and made a run for it. But instead of ending up outside the castle, as their map said they would, they ended up in the Queen's Hall itself. They found themselves surrounded with growth modules, full of Kavesi soldiers, even some they recognized. Before they could get far, the False Queen interrupted them, accompanied by N. Tackling a ruler of the world and a master swordsman, the team was utterly outmatched, and were only saved by a stroke of luck when the Queen overheated, falling apart and revealing her true identity to our heroes. The Queen, Noah, Lance, and Uni devoted their entire lives to was nothing but a construct, merely a figurehead to unite troops around, not even their Queen could be trusted. Anne stepped in and Noah's head began to ache, the proximity of the two souls approaching affecting his mind, although with his Mobius mask, Anne was unrecognizable to Noah and the crew as the same person. Just before N could attack, he was interrupted by the Lost Numbers, breaking in with an assault to steal growth modules, and conveniently picking up all boss while they were at it, leaving N to smolder in his own edginess. Although our heroes were untrusting at first, having just learnt their entire world as a lie, the Lost Numbers were quick to explain their common goal of defeating Mobius and securing a future for everyone, one without war, shortened lives, and eternal stasis. Our heroes joined them and were brought to the city, hidden within the Bionis Sword. Monica, their current leader, told them about the Founders, how life was made possible within the city, and how they fight back against Zed's tyranny, both with the Old Boss's power and by stealing growth modules. Unfortunately, they had little time to rest. Even after completing Vandem's dying wish for them to find this city, they had now learnt so much more and knew they couldn't stop here. They were going to continue fighting, 
all the way until they could stop the unending world war and fix the world to give everyone a chance to choose their own future. The first step would be to awaken Queen Nia from her slumber, a task easier said than done. Gondor, who had the pendant that allowed them to get into Cloudkeep, was currently imprisoned in an Agnes castle for several felonies better left unmentioned, soon to be executed. Once again, the crew successfully managed to infiltrate the castle with ease, it's the getting out part they really need to work on. As they made their escape attempt with Gondor and her crew, they were stopped by N and M. The only way for anyone to have known they were escaping was if there was a leak, and sure enough, there was. A member of the Lost Numbers, Shania, had finally shown her true colors and betrayed her people. She showed her disdain to Gondor for surpassing her in anything they did, and her anger at Ouroboros for taking her chance to finally be a hero. While our heroes were able to cover for Gondor, allowing her to escape, they were now in quite the bind, forced to face off against two of the most powerful Mobius in all the land. M's Mobius ability allowed her to enter people's consciousness, directly controlling their bodies, which she used to great effect against our heroes. Although, unbeknownst to everyone except Mio, as M entered her brain, being two parts of the same soul, their memories intertwined, and in an instant, she mentally conveyed to Mio that she was here to help. It was finally time for M to atone for her and N's sins, and she had the perfect plan. Without even N noticing, she swapped her and Mio's consciousness, so that our Mio was in M's body and vice versa. Although it wasn't quite time for her to reveal her plan, and the battle from there went about how you would expect, with the crew utterly thrashed by N. Thrown into prison, the crew was pretty hopeless. N was planning to put them all through a public execution, or still, Mia was about to hit the end of a tenth term, and N was going to perform her a homecoming, ensuring that her soul would break off from the cycle of rebirth never to return to this world again. Devastated, Noah screamed to let them go, but N refused, fully devoted to keeping the eternal now, so that he may stay with his vision of Mio forever. Now, of course the only Mio imprisoned was M. How Mio was currently busy in M's body, learning of a second annihilator within the castle. Worried for the city, Mio teleported over and explained the situation, having them evacuate immediately. Soon enough, Mia's tenth term was up, and the gang was brought out to watch as she was taken away from the world. Mio! The homecoming began, and Noah couldn't bear it, screaming out to her, but it was futile. And as her final motes floated into the sky, he felt true despair. Next in line for execution, and lined up his sword with Noah's neck, but as he chopped down, he was stopped by M, or should I say Mio, as she revealed the swap they made during the battle. Meaning that the person N had just sent off was his beloved, his eternal mate, and now she was gone forever. Stricken with grief, N screamed to the heavens, asking why she would do it. After all the sacrifices he made for them, why? How Mio explains that she had felt trapped, all M had wanted was to live out her days with him, but he stretched their time at the price of others. To N, his time with her was everything, but she just wanted things to end. Mobius can only exist by taking the souls of those who bless this world, and M thought if she died, maybe N would realize it too. Before she left, M had wanted to give Noah everything she knew about N, to lose and lose, and to get back up again, to rise up against the despair, she believed that if anyone in the world could do it, it would be Noah. So she shared all of her memories with Mio before departing from the world, which brings us back to the present. And couldn't accept the cruel reality of what he'd just done, and would die before he saw those who took away his Mio get away, even if really, his Mio was the one who made her choice. Noah and Mio prepared to fight, and we see her eye glowing not quite like an iris, but not quite like a Mobius either. Rather, a combination of the two. Two souls in one. Going mad with anger, and prepared to kill them all, but 
With a new Mobius form, Mia was able to break the party free from their shackles, letting them fight back, and even defeat N, with Noah pulling out a new form of Lucky Seven from within Ouroboros. And the sword that was meant to bring the end to the Mobius does its job quite proficiently, even bringing down the Mobius-controlled Agnian Queen. Before they could even recuperate, the enemy revealed their second annihilator aimed right at the Lost City, the location of which Shania had tipped off to them. The gang lost all hope as they saw the city wiped off the map, but Mia laughed it off. Gondor and the rest of the Lost Numbers showed up, revealing that they were able to move the entire city thanks to Mia's forewarning, turning out to be a massive Furanus, a secret so well guarded not even Shania knew about it. Losing her mind, with nothing ever having gone her way, not even after sacrificing her friends and family, she decides to start from a new beginning, removing herself from the wall so that perhaps the next iteration of herself might be a better person. Night falls and our gang takes a well-deserved rest from combat. Sharing some of M's memories, Mio brought Noah and the rest of Ouroboros to the original city of the Lost Numbers, and told the story of how N made his impossible choice between Mio and his people, which ultimately led to the ruins laying before them. Shocked not only at N's choice, but at Zed's unwanted cruelty, Noah vowed to destroy him and save this world stopped in time. Without any immediate threats, the gang ventured out to find Nia, the true Egnian queen, and awaken her from a long slumber. After climbing steep cliffs, crossing frigid mountains, and finding the castle's pedestal deep within the rock face, they were finally able to seek Cloudkeep for themselves, summoning it down from the sky. After venturing in, they found that it was full of architecture like they had never seen, clearly not made by any run-of-the-mill engineer. They finally arrived at the top, and with the help of the pendant they had received from Gondor, they awakened the queen from a deep sleep. They approached her, but they let their guard down too soon, with a projectile impaling the queen's chest. From the sky, J and D dropped down, having followed Ouroboros all the way to the hidden ruler. A bloody battle ensued, with Noah, Lance, and Uni desperately trying to convince their old companion to reject Zed's Eternal now and to come back to them as friends. Despite Yorn's terrible actions as a Mobius, the gang still believed in him, knowing that the Yorn they knew still knew somewhere deep inside his twisted soul, and they were right. After all the encounters, Yorn finally realized, despite all the horrific things he had done, Noah, Lance, and Uni still saw him as their friend, as good old pal Yorn, not Jay the Mobius. They had never seen themselves as better or superior to him in any way, only ever as equals. Realizing he could never atone for all the things he'd done, he made it up to the crew by interlinking with Jay and not letting go. The interlink reached its max, but Yorn refused to release it, destroying both him and Dee in an annihilation event, in his last breath apologizing to Lance for all the trouble he's caused. Yorn was able to die at peace, for, at last, he was able to be of use to his friends. After a moment of recognition for Yorn's sacrifice, the crew headed upstairs to check on the Queen, who awakened from a slumber as if she wasn't just impaled through the chest. Luckily, Nia is a special type of blade, which is a complicated life form originating from Universe B and a topic for a different video. But what it does mean is that she can heal from virtually any wound as long as it doesn't hit the core crystal in the middle of her chest. She quickly regained her composure upon seeing our heroes and greeted the Ouroboros crew, introducing herself as the true Queen of the Agnians and creator of Origin. Of course, none of them knew what Origin was, so she explained it to them, going over its purpose, how it led to Zed, and the creation of this frozen world. With the Queen of the Agnians by their side, our characters finally had everything they needed to save Queen Melia from Origin and begin their attack on Zed, to fix this cruel world and its corrupting nature. There was just one small problem, actually getting to Origin. While Nia confirmed that Zed resided in the heart of the structure, 
Despite her seemingly infinite knowledge, she had no clue how they'd actually get there. No ship was capable of braving the storm to get to Origin, which lay deep within the vortex of the sea, and Mio's teleportation powers all Mobius have access to had been cut off after Zed realized she and M had switched bodies. The gang checked in with the Lost Numbers to see if they had any ultra-powerful boats specifically designed to brave a vortex no man has ever survived before with no real reason to ever try to get through it till now, that they had somehow kept hidden the whole time, available for use in the next few days. And what do you know, they did. After some quick resource gathering, the ship got its final adjustments and the crew prepared for their invasion of Origin, to save Queen Melia and take on Zed. Their final journey, where they would either free the world from its chains, allowing it to experience the future after a manalium of standing still, or doom it to remain shackled for another eternity. By some miracle, the crew was able to bypass the system's defense and sneak inside of Origin. There were no guards, or at least not in the typical manner. Instead, there were these creatures. Purple and smoky, dissolving entirely after death. Despite their looks, these entities are made from the same matter as everything else in this world, but in a much less refined and chaotic structure, barely more put together than the purple fog we've been seeing across the wall. As our heroes continued on, they saw where the first Furonises were made, monsters of ungodly strength, and things well beyond their comprehension. After wandering the endless halls of this long corrupted machine, our heroes eventually reached where Queen Melia was being held captive, and guarding her, N. Their wards didn't manage to reach him, so they had no choice but to fight. Noah promising to save the other half of himself from the despair he has surrounded himself with for the past thousand years. It's a long battle, but Warboss has come much too far to give up now, eventually driving in back, forcing him to submit. And struggle to let himself surrender. If he stopped now, that'd mean becoming Mobius, burning down the city of his own people, and serving Zed's cruel commands to keep up the eternal now will all have been for nothing. If he stops now, what was the point of all the sacrifices he made? Mio comforts him, explaining how M loved him till the very end and wanted for nothing more than to stay with him forever, just not at the expense of others. After he became Mobius, he changed, not even keeping his name, not even calling Mio by hers. Noah realized that if he had been in the same situation, he probably would have made the same choice as N, so he doesn't blame him. But thanks to the opportunity presented to him, he can do better. He can free the world from its stasis instead of embracing it. He can change the future. All they need is for N to stand down. At long last, he's given the chance to move forwards, and N finally lets go of the Endless Now, accepting our hero's offer. As he releases himself from the constraints of the Mobius, he undergoes a similar process as M, freeing his worn physical body from the world after thousands of years of use, but letting his mind merge with his other half, with Noah. Sharing his memories and giving Noah the eye of one who is half Ouroboros and half Mobius, the eye of one who can free the future from millions of years of stagnation. With N finally at peace, the crew can move on and free Melia from a Manelia long imprisonment. Awakened, she thanks her heroes and prepares herself for their battle against Zed. As she spent her time imprisoned observing the world through a robot self, she didn't need to be caught up to speed and after a quick introduction, teleported away to greet her nation. Finally, under rule of their true queen, they could prepare for their final battle against Origin itself. The game continues to Zed's theater where they'll face their final foe, and the unified attack begins. For the first time in history, Keeves and Agnes are ruled by their true queens and fight not against themselves but together, along with the lost numbers as the siege on Origin begins. Not willing to overlook such disrespect, Zed returns fire, scorching not only the colonies but the land in its entirety. It's clear that he no longer cares for this world all the better if it all burns down. He'll simply create a new one without these rebels to interfere. The two powers holding him back from doing so, Queen Nia and Melia, are rethroned at last and bring out their castle's true form, joining the fray. 
War in the Endgame now. Our heroes enter the theater and see where Zed has watched over the world for an eternity. Representing the uncertainty of the future, he doesn't understand why anyone would want to bring back the unpredictability of flowing time and refuses to let them get the chance. He explains how this is the way the world should be, the endless wars, the suffering, and Mobius as its audience, forever unchanging. He'll do whatever he needs to to keep it that way. For the first time, Zed gets up on the stage of this world, finally taking part of the conflict he's been watching for centuries and takes on Ouroboros. He shackles their powers and changes the essence of the stage to whatever he wills. The world is his stage and this stage the world, so he may manipulate it and those upon it however he pleases. Only through the connections our heroes have made throughout their arduous journey are they able to break free of Zed's chains. Noah pulls out the sword of the end and shatters the stage so that a new future may arise. Finally getting serious, Zed lets out a colonel scream, dissolving his physical form and absorbing all the nearby Mobius, regressing to his chaotic state, merely an entity feeding off people's fears. Origin begins to change and forms into a giant war machine, fighting off those who are trying to give support to our heroes while Zed deals with them head on. The fate of Ionius will be decided in the coming clash. In the climax of battle, Noah finally understands what drives Mobius's power and why they seek the Endless now. Within all of us, there's some Mobius. It's our fear, uncertainty of our actions, cutting off our way to the future. Zed is the culmination of all that fear felt by the souls from within Origin, so to fight him, they'll need to believe in the path they've walked so far and the future that lies in front of them. Even after Zed splits up our heroes, they don't give up. Joined by the souls of those who they helped upon their travels, they drive Zed back. Taking heavy damage, he unleashes more of his immense energy, powered by the fear within everyone of the uncertain future. His power overwhelming, a white glow begins to encompass him and grows outwards, inhaling our heroes in a white ball of pure energy. Inside the glow, our characters are in a warped space, with the laws of the universe non-existent under the pressure of Zed's insane energy output. Although at this point, it's no longer Zed, but a single, intense desire. From Noah and Mio's eyes come N and M. They had never really left this world, letting their soul reside in their other half's body, but now they had to say their goodbyes. As their half of the soul is still Mobius and represents the guilt and regret it stands for, they cannot survive, as their prolonged existence only serves to strengthen those who would keep this moment frozen in time. They embody the same desire, so they cannot remain, and despite Noah's pleads for them to stay, they go off and join the Orb of Energy, causing the last burst of chaotic power needed for the ball to collapse under its extreme power enveloping the characters, origin, and the entire world in light. Our characters find themselves in a grassy field, with a view of their two worlds about to collide, having been frozen on the brink for the past million years. If planets could edge, this is what it would look like. Noah concurs that, at first, Zed may not have been such a malicious character. He simply wanted to protect the world from an uncertain future he had no control over, so he created a world he could control. A reasonable choice, although our characters decide that it was wrong, as a world with no future is doomed before it can even begin. Change is scary, but being true to yourself is far more important. The queens walk over, asking Noah if he's sure of his choice, as the stilled flow of time will soon restart, and he hesitates, wondering if anyone should ever have the right to make a choice affecting so many people but eventually accepts that this is the way it should be, that the future must continue. While there's a chance Origin fails in its purpose and the two worlds collide, obliterating each other, Noah believes in the actions they've taken, the future they've created, so the choice is obvious. But I mean, why not keep the world like this? If you just took away the eternal war thing, this world could be pretty awesome. Eternal life for 10 year cycles doesn't sound terrible to me faced with potential oblivion. And what about the lost numbers? Having been born into this world, their data isn't stored within origin, 
so even if this plan succeeds, none of them will be in the two walls, but I digress. Before time resumes, Noah spends some time with himself, and after some contemplation, throws his weapon into the sea. In the future he plans for, there will be no need for weapons, not anymore. Meeting up for the last time, he thanks Mio for sticking with him through thick and thin, and she says the same. All the old boys say their final goodbye to their partner, knowing that they will soon be walls apart, but even so, they'll always be together in one way or another. Noah and Mio embrace for the first and last time. Queen Nia and Lady Melia stand atop their castles, wondering how their planets will react once time is unfrozen, praying that their future's infinite potential is not stopped short by cataclysm. But their warring is unwanted, as regardless of the situation, we have no choice but to carry on with our lives. Even with the walls about to separate, Nia still has faith. Even if now the walls become separated for a time, one day they'll surely get to walk hand in hand again. The two lovers say their farewells, and the planets begin to separate. Noah knows this is goodbye, but he can't just stand to watch her leave, and they chase after each other. The Ouroboros crew desperately trying to stay connected with their partners. As they pull away, Noah promises to come see her, and Mio makes the same promise back, as their planets drift ever further apart. Time begins again. After an eternity of standing still, life on both planets boots up again. Origin succeeded, managing to restart both planets' life right after they passed each other, resuming the walls exactly how they were. Successfully having avoided oblivion, most people moved on without even realizing anything had happened at all. But a few still remembered. Thanks so much for watching. I have more Xenoblade videos coming soon, as well as some stuff on other games. Either way, I'd always appreciate a like or a sub, but really it's up to you. Thanks again.